some of you have been wondering how come Paul talks to us about all these complicated things, this covenants, these mountains, this, this circumcision stuff, and he doesn't get to the stuff that is of interest to us. We want to look at the fruits of the Spirit. We want to look at uh, how we can get better, become better Christians, improve our lives, and how can we can really become, live more holy lives. Because we already know, yeah, sure, we're served by grace. We, we know that. So we want to get better. We want to improve. We want to uh, become better followers of Christ. Sure. But don't rush faster than Paul. Paul takes his time for a reason. So be patient with the word of God. Don't go faster than it. Don't go faster than Paul. Paul was probably the greatest, one of the greatest intellectuals of, among Christianity. And so I would find it hard to believe that you, are, we, you and I are better than him. So let's go in his pace. Let's not jump to chapter 5 and the fruits of the Spirit. Let's not jump to chapter 6 too quickly. It'll get there. He wants us to get it right before we jump into obedience. He's not saying don't obey. He's saying let me give you the basis for obeying because it matters. So. My message today is about how the gospel transforms you from the inside out as opposed to joyless duty from the outside in. I'm going to say that again. How the gospel transforms you. Pastor preaches about grace all the time. The God, listen to this. Let's read my lips. The gospel transforms you from the inside out, not coerces you with joyless duty that coerces you from the outside in. So I got this illustration. Here goes the first one from my father-in-law, uh, Dennis. Uh, they're visiting here today. So my father-in-law is a chemical engineer. And so I, I really need to get this right because otherwise I was going to uh, make a mistake, a, grass, a cross, gross, uh, grave mistake, and he was going to be like, oh, this is not like that, son. So I, I double checked with him twice. Um, if you have a piece of metal, those of you who work in the steel mill, and, and, and you, you, you'll know what I'm talking about too. So when you bent, let's say we bent this piece of metal, piece of iron, you bent it, right? There are two ways to returning it to its original shape to its original straight shape uh, one is you just get a hammer you beat it and hopefully you bend it until it's finally straight again but what happens to that that straightening it's imperfect uh, it shows clearly yeah not new anymore it shows also uh, it makes it, and this is what uh, Dennis was explaining, explaining to me, the, mo it, the fact that we bent it, it changed the molecular structure of the metal, and it broke it. And so once, so instead of being like this, see, it became like this as you bent it. And then as we try to bend it back using power, using force, it, it just comes into, it doesn't fit well anymore and it destroys and it changes the molecular structure of the metal. And it becomes weaker and it's very sensitive and you can just go like this and break it. And it becomes weaker. Isn't that right? You work with wires, uh, David. I'm sure you know, you go like this. When you don't have a, 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 a cutter, you just go like this and metal breaks. Wires break when you bend them because they go, they're easy to break. And so that's the difference between gospel transformation versus moral reformation. A self-help type of theology. A self-help. So I've, I've said this before. If you want just to improve and get a little better and just kind of uh, get over your, your habits, um, go to a motivational uh, conference. Go to see Tony Robbins. Um, go to see, you know, you know T Tony Robbins, you've seen him. Um, uh, go to a motivational speaker. I'll get a life coach or something like that. Uh, and that, that will probably help you get bad habits out of your life. But if you want true 
inside out, from above, gospel transformation, come to Jesus. Come to the cross, come to the gospel. It is an entirely different. If you go to self-help stuff, if you go, hey, come, come, you know, this is it, this is it, you just gotta change, you gotta change, you gotta change, you gotta change. All that that does is just, it's like bending the metal. And that doesn't do anything. You are weak because you did it from the outside in, coerced by the duty that you have to do in order to get back straight, to straighten up. And so you were coerced, you are not free. But if you use heat, and here's the gospel transformation, if you use heat, if that metal goes under fire, it bends back the molecular structure, the fibers, all that stuff that was broken, it wasn't fibers, I'm sorry. All the molecular structures that were bent and messed up are healed, are restructured again to its original and it becomes stronger, stronger. Do you wanna be a strong Christian? Do you wanna be a strong human being? Well, that's the gospel transformation from the inside out because you want to, not because you have to. Because, not because, and so, it, and you will see this easily. And it goes across lines between liberals and conservatives, between religious people and secular people. If they stand on their own feet, on their own righteousness, and they're obeying and being good because they have to, you will see they're weak people, they're hypersensitive, very touchy to criticism, they can't take a punch, they will be very weak, and circumstances changes in their goals and they're crushed, they're despondent, very depressed. Depression comes in and they're angry and fearful of the circumstances. So, we want gospel transformation, amen? Gospel transformation is different than moral, mere moral reformation. There's a new birth, a new creature altogether. When the gospel comes into your life, makes you an honest person, a courageous person, an unselfish person, you stop looking for ways to avoid returning your tithe, for example. You know, let's see, what, what, how can I rationalize within myself, within a few things here and there, and a few arguments, how can I give less of me? See, I remember I had a, a couple of elders back when I was in, in my small little churches. As we were growing and as we were, as the Lord was blessing us, one of them came to me excited. Hey, pastor, pastor, guess what? Tithe is up. I check with the treasurer. Tithe is up. We are, people are tithing and giving their offerings. It's, 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 it's awesome. Why was that elder so excited? Shouldn't he be, oh, pastor, you're taking our money. Look at the suits you're wearing. That's our tithe. Here goes our tithe. That's such a natural way of looking at godly things. The spiritual things are discerned spiritually. Natural things, sure, it's money to you, sure. Offerings, holy offerings, bless holy tithe is to the Lord. But you, see, Instead, gospel transformation, you're looking for ways. Where else can I help? Where is there that lonely person in church where I can approach and say hello? Where is that neighbor where I can invite him to church? You, you are a person that lives from the inside out and it's generous and wants to give and it's a smile and you're joyful and you want to give as opposed to retain. You wanna open up to your community instead of being closed and just me here in this bunker called conservative church, just myself, nobody else, and just a little bit more, but that's fine. So, there's a sweetness that's come to you. There's this softness that comes to you when the gospel has transformed you. So, take a look at, um, I've come to love this author, and it's, his name is C.S. Lewis, uh, and he says, we must not suppose that even if we succeed in making everyone nice, i.e. moral, 
good moral people, we should have saved their souls. So we turn nice people, you know, people who are rough on the edges, we turn them into nice people, good, decent people. We must not assume that we've saved their souls. A world of nice people contending in their own niceness, looking no farther, turned away from God. Would be, you've been to Europe, people are nice in Europe, some of you have been to Europe, people are nice, Europeans are nice, but a lot of them have left the gospel. So, would be just as desperate, these people would be just as desperate in need of salvation as miserable world and might be even more difficult to save. Why? Because they're like the Pharisees. They were nice, good people, but good in the worst sense of the word. They knew it. They stood on their own feet. They, the Savior was standing in front of their eyes and they could not see him for who he was. Mere improvement is not redemption. Though redemption always, listen to this, and I, I, the pastor is just preaching this great stuff, listen. Though redemption always improves people. Sometimes impro improves people? Always, that's what C.S. Lewis says. Always improves people, even here and now, and will, and in the end, improve them to a degree that we cannot imagine. I can't believe I'm giving this much. You look at yourself, oh my goodness, why? God became a man to turn creatures into sons. Remember that was last message at the, at the dunes when we were there? At, uh, you are sons if you are in Christ. You are sons. Came to turn creatures into sons. You, men and women, just as much as men are brides as well. Not simply to produce better men of the old kind, but to produce a new kind of man. It's not like teaching a horse, and this is a cool illustration, I thought. It's not like teaching a horse to become, to jump better and better, but it's like turning a horse into a winged creature. Of course, once it has got its wings, it will soar over fences, not just jump, which could have never been jumped and thus beat the natural horse at its own game. So, what is the gospel, friends? Well, we've read it and we've seen them in Galatians over and over again. The gospel is that God sent his son. As chapter, verse one says here, stand fast therefore in the liberty, the freedom by which Christ has made us free. Did you catch that? Christ might make you free. Christ will make you free. Oh, so glad to see Rita this morning. Rita, would you help us with the grammar? Present, future, possibly. What tense is this? Has made us free. Yeah. Has made us present perfect, right? If I'm not mistaken. So, he has made us. He has made us free. So you either believe that or you take it up with, with the word of God. Take it up with Paul. He has made us free. And not to be entangled again in a yoke of bondage. See, the gospel is that God sent his son, born of a virgin, lived a sinless, perfect, righteous life on behalf of his people. If we believe that his righteousness is credited to us, his record of perfect living is credited to us, and we stand before God as though we've never sinned. Amen. You read that in Steps to Christ, I'm sure. That reality, that acceptance, brings as a result, as fruit, gospel transformation. The gospel is not the transform life. I've heard people say, you need to live the gospel, not just believe it, live the gospel. No, the gospel happened a long time ago, 2,000 years ago, in the life and ministry and death of Jesus, and it, that you don't live it. It, was, it happened once. I don't, I'm not saved by believing in the way you live. I'm saved by what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. So that is why we encourage new members like Larry, don't look at us, look at Jesus. Amen. You've heard that before, right? Because I don't live the gospel. Jesus does. Jesus did. So... Instead of the, the, the gospel, instead of the gospel is not the transformed life, the gospel transforms your life. That's being in Christ. 
That's what it means being in Christ. When you're in Christ, you inevitably, inevitably become a new person. It's not the other way around. You don't become good or transformed so that you can be saved. Remember here, Christ has set us free and he's telling that to people who are in circumcision, who are messed up and, and, and believing in all this stuff and being entangled again in a yoke of, of slavery. He's telling them, Christ has set you free. You, don't, you are saved and then you become good. That is why it's called fruit. And we will see, that's our next sermon. It's called fruit of the spirit. It's not the cause of the spirit, but the fruit. It's that simple. Your fruit doesn't bring the spirit, but it's the other way around. The spirit brings the fruit. Amen. Brings about results. The gospel brings about good results. It brings about the fruit. You don't buy the fruit. It's not that you reach the fruit just because the spirit brings the fruit. N not by the way you live, but in account of what the way he lived. His performance, not yours. That's why Jesus could say to that poor sinful woman in the Jacob's well, Samaritan woman, he told her, if you knew the gift of God, the gift of God, if you knew, if you just knew, you just lived by this, you, you would ask for more, you would desire this. It would not be like, oh, I don't wanna listen to my parents' stuff for bringing me to church. No, you would, if you knew the gift of God, you would ask him, over and over. Knowing that you are loved and adopted as a son into God's family changes you your entire life. And that includes your desires, which we will look into in a minute. If you get this wrong, if you get this just as a simple order wrong, you are in the circumcision group. You're in the circumcision party. Therefore, you're under a curse. Christ's righteousness is not covering you. You don't get Christ's righteousness. And that's why Paul can cry out and say, you foolish Galatians, don't you see what you're doing? You foolish, come to freedom. Christ has set us free. You foolish Galatians, come to freedom. Hence the title of our sermon, From, foolish, from Foolishness to Freedom. That's Paul's point. So what is Christian freedom? Mere moral freedom brings, mere moral reformation, according to Paul, brings us back into a slavery, into captivity, into bondage, into foolishness. You're trapped. But gospel transformation gives you real freedom. So what is real freedom? In order to be free in the fullest sense, and I, I picked up this in one of the commentators, it was, it was a fascinating um, uh, illustration. And, and I, 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 I will have, I will, uh, since Anthony uh, is, is, is growing up and becoming a young man, I will, I will, I will use, uh, if, you, if you allow me, I will, I will use you as, an, as, a, as a cool example. So, um, before we go into the illustration, you being free in the fullest sense of the word is when you and I have the opportunity, the ability, and the desire to do what will always make us happy. Did you get that? When you have the ability, the opportunity, the desire to do what will make you happy always, forever. So, freedom of opportunity to do what you can, what you can. Freedom of ability to do what we desire. Freedom of desire, not duty, but something that I don't, it's not that I have to do this, it's because I want to do this. The freedom to do what will bring us an ending joy. So, for example, um, I, uh, Anthony, I, I, I love uh, when Amy and I were dating, um, I really wanted to go to this place where they, uh, they jumped on, on, on this parachutes, okay? This, this is not like the regular parachute that you jump from a, um, from a plane or something like that. Uh, and and on, on, uh, on, uh, on Tuesday, we were at Wayne and Noreen's house and, and, uh, and uh, Steve Clarida and others were talking about how they, they've, they've jumped on, 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 on a parachute, right? Would you like to jump on a parachute? Out of plane, yeah, that'll be fun, right? So, um, he, so this was something similar and a little bit safer. 
uh, Father David is getting a little concerned now by the time. <laughs> um, so he, let's suppose I take him. Okay, when you turn 16, we'll, we'll, we'll go on a mission trip, Anthony, and we'll, we'll go there. So we'll, in, the, in my country, there's, they do this thing called paragliding, and it's very popular, and it, because of tourists, it got more and more popular. And paragliding is like you have the parachute opened, and you jump from a cliff. You jump from a, from a, from a cliff a into the, n the abyss, the, 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 the cliff. And, 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 and because of the wind, because there's great winds, the, the, the parachute just opens up and takes you up and, and you're ready to go and you start flying. And they have this amazing way of controlling it uh, with, with strings and stuff that they just, they just go wherever they want. They catch the, 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 uh, the waves of air, hot air or, 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 or cold air or whatever. And, and they are able, somehow they know so well and, and they're able to take you on a flight. And it's so much fun, Anthony, it's so much fun. So let's suppose Anthony turns 16 and says, Dad, I'm going on a mission trip to Ecuador. We're going to go to those churches that, that flood. All right. So he goes, and, and, uh, and so we, we, go, we go with uh, their signed permission and everything. We go. So, however, on the way to the location, our car breaks down. And or something, a tire blows up or something like that happens. And so while we're there trying to fix it, our appointment goes by, time goes by, the days go by, and we're stuck and we can't get to the location. We can't even get to see the parachute. We can't even get to put on the parachute. We can't even meet the instructor or anything like that. So that's not freedom. Does he want to do this? Does he want to jump? Does Anthony want to jump? Yes, he wants to jump. Does he, uh, does he, yes, uh, he, he wants to, but however, he doesn't have the opportunity. He missed the opportunity, and then we have to go back to the United States, time's up, you know, and, and, and we come back. And so you miss the opportunity of paragliding, the fun opportunity to get that selfie there and everything. <clears throat> we didn't do it. You lack the freedom of opportunity. Now, let's suppose nothing happened to the car. Second case scenario, Anthony. Nothing happened. We're good. We get to the location. Um, and, uh, and, uh, and so he puts on the, 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 uh, the, 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 the backpack, the parachute, and all the stuff, the strapping, the harness, and everything. And, it, and, 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 Anthony, and, and then Anthony is looking at the instructor and says, uh, uh, now what do I do? What do I do? And the, and the instructor says, oh, I thought you knew. I thought you were fully instructed in this. No, I'm not letting you go, you crazy American kid. <laughs> you're going to die. You're going to kill yourself. You jump off the cliff, you're going to kill yourself. So no, you're not going. And so he wants to do it. He has the opportunity to do it, but he lacks the ability, the know-how to do it. All right? So, now, the next one is, let's suppose the time com comes to jump. Car doesn't break down. He has taken the course. He's just fine to jump. He's ready to go. He knows. He's got the desire. He's happy. He's excited. When he gets there, um, Jading is there too. And, uh, and there's, and you know, it's, he's 16 years old and, and, and there's, uh, there's an Ecuadorian girl that says, hola, Anthony. And, and you know, he, he, he feels a little embarrassed and, uh, and so he's, you know, he's getting a little nervous about this, this, this thing and it's scary. He looks down the cliff and, oh my goodness, that's far. I'm gonna die. I'm not gonna see Northwest Indiana again and my cousin's over there and like, I'm done, I'm not going. And he feels, so scared and, and, and he's freaking out, he's sweating, his hands are sweating, he's so scared to go and he doesn't want to jump. But because there is Ecuadorian girl saying, vas a saltar? <laughs> and so he is forced and then Jaden is all ready, Jaden has no fear, Jaden just jumps and then he's like, okay, I'm going. And he's freaking out, he almost cries and he's screaming and he does it. Did he do it freely? He lacked the freedom of desire. He was coerced from the outside pressures to perform. Many Christians live their lives that way. 
Many young people live their lives that way. Coerced and in duty. Duty is joyless. They, they, they can't live happily. They don't, their Christian life is not a happy life. So, last, uh, lastly, this is number four. Suppose, we make it, Anthony, we make it to the location. Uh, everything is great. You are happy to go. You have the ability, the know-how, the desire. You can't wait to jump. You look down and you see the beach down there and it's like, whoa, that's so cool. You're ready to go. And you start and you jump. But suddenly when you're jumping, the strings of the paraglide don't work. Your parachute might functions and you're going as fast as gravity is taking you and you're crashing in the rocks in the shore. You're free falling. So did he have the opportunity? He did. Did he have the ability? The know-how. Yes, he was instructed. He jumped. The instructor said, okay, go. Did he have the desire to go? Yes. Oh, yes. He wants to do it. He wants to live free and jump freely. But what he's going to do, or what he's doing, is going to kill him. Many, the so-called free movement of most of us young people, we want to live free from the shackles of this culture, and we want to live free and liberally. Think, take, take, they don't know that what they're doing will not make them happy in the next, the next morning. It's just one night. It's just one night of drinking. It's just one night of hookup. It's just one night of free sex or one night of drugs. One, one, one month, one stage of my life. I want to live free. I want to, but you don't know. You will regret those decisions. So living freely, in order to be truly free, you must not like freedom of opportunity, freedom of ability, freedom of desire, and the freedom to do something that would really make you happy, at the thing, something that you will not regret in eternity. That's what freedom is like. And that's the freedom Paul is calling Christians here. He's saying, hey, look at this. We want, I want you to be free. Don't go back. And so what matters is, is not, do you, do you realize that for Paul, it's not a matter of balance. See, get this into your head. The, 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 the concept of balance and equilibrium and 50-50, grace and works and all this stuff, this, this, let's, let's preach about, it's not biblical. Balance is not a biblical concept. You won't find the word. You won't find the, 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 you won't find the, 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 the concept in the Bible. Some of you will like to say, well, Pastor Danny, you should preach a little bit of, you know, grace-centered, Christ-centered sermons and a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit more of uh, law and, 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 you know, living a good life because that's what matters. But Paul knows none of, it, none of that stuff. He knows about Christ bringing about transformation, a new birth, which is entirely different. So how many, so if you say, okay, pastor, you should preach this many sermons, how many? How do we know how many? 25 out of 52? 20? 10? H how many? See, we're left with your opinion and mine. We're left with consensus and absolutely no objective directive. The only objectivity is brought about by the gospel of Jesus Christ, by the correct reading of his word. And so what matters for Paul is why you do the reasons why you do what you do. And here's the solution. Here's, here's the, Paul's solution. Why you do what you do. Why do you do it? Why do you stop when you're being tempted and you say, no, no, I won't go into this. Why do you get up in the morning and pray? Because you have to, 
or because you're free to do it and you love to pray and spend time with Jesus. You love to spend time in his word. You love to look at complicated texts and you're like, well, you know, this is not me. I'm not a theologian. And God says, no, yes, you are. You are a Christian believer. This word is for you. Go and stick your nose in it and read it and meditate it. Try to understand it. I'm sending you my Holy Spirit. This is food for you. Eat this words, assimilate and live them in your life. Bring them about. The Lord will bring about fruit. So it is not about balance, but it's about the relationship, the reasons of why. Are they free reasons? Ask yourself, are they free reasons? You just want to prove the other person wrong? Do you just want to do this? How, how are, see, the thing is, look, look what Paul is saying here. Indeed, Paul, I say, verse 2, 5 2, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. You have fallen to grace. Verse 5, for, um, I, I'm sorry, verse 6, for it is in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor incircumcision, uncircumcision avails anything, but faith working through love. Faith and love become this power, this force, this inner strength that brings about a transformed life, that brings about that freedom of opportunity, that freedom of ability, that freedom of desire. See, we, why is Paul talking about freedom? Because he just talked to us, last message, he told us about being a slave according to Hagar, trying to work your own stuff, your own workings, trying to put God in your own terms. God, I know you said you were gonna give me a son, said Abraham and, and, and Sarah, but we're gonna do, you're taking too long, we're gonna do it in our own terms. So Hagar, Come over here. God says, no, I'm going to do a miracle. You need to learn how to live by faith. Let me teach you. You're going to have, you old Sarah? Yes. You're going to have a baby. And it's going to be Isaac. And through that, it's going to be salvation for all. And so, friends, the, the gospel teaches us to obey. Titus 2, 11 and 12 says, For grace, the grace of God has appeared that has appeared, that offers salvation to all people, it teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-control, upright and godly lives in the present age. What teaches us to live, to say no to unrighteousness and ungodliness? The grace that has appeared to us through Jesus Christ our Lord, the gospel. The gospel is what teaches us to say no to ungodliness. So the reasons, the fact, the, just the fact. See, what Paul is trying to tell him, you are becoming. Why does, understand this, when he says you're going back, you Galatians are going back in a yoke of bondage. Why does he say you're going back in this yoke of bondage? The Galatians haven't been circumcised yet. Paul is trying to fight with them and against the Judaizers, the teachers, who are saying, you need to circumcise. And so they're in this struggle of authority and this struggle of teaching. And so Paul is going and saying, hey, circumcision and incircumcision doesn't really matter. What matters is that you're free in Christ, and as you're free, you just live that out through faith and love, and that's what brings about the Reformation. I'm not against Reformation, Paul says. I'm not against you living obediently. And he will tell us as w to walk by the Spirit in verses, uh, 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 and, uh, starting verse 7 and on onwards. He doesn't have a problem with that. In fact, he wants us to live and go deeper and deeper beyond, be like that, that horse that goes, that can jump much higher. Be obedient beyond we can ever imagine. But he cares about this the reasons why we obey if you decide to obey the law for the wrong reasons you will be burdened captive galatians see the galatians why is he saying that you, you don't need to you are, you will go back they haven't been circumcised yet so why is he saying you will what yoke is he talking about why will you go back why would the galatians go back to a yoke of bondage 
they never even knew about circumcision. He's saying that if you circumcise, you'll go back to a yoke of bondage. What he's saying is, you were pagan people. You had your fisherman god, you had your, 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 uh, uh, your fertility god, you had your agricultural god, you had all this stuff. You're, you are no better than where you came from if you do this. Because you have stepped out of grace, you've fallen out of grace, and you are back into uh, obeying God for the wrong reasons. You're trying to bribe him for his salvation. You are subject. See, the problem is that you are, when you have fallen out of grace, you are obeying God for the wrong reasons, you are subject to your circumstances. Circumstances threaten what you are living for. You will be filled with fear. If somebody, the thing that you're living for is threatened, you will have fear, you will have anger, you will have, and when things don't go your way, you will complain and get angry at God. When suffering came, that's the worst. So Paul says, don't obey God for the wrong reasons. You will be entangled again, the bondage of pride, fear, failure, touchiness to criticism, etc. So, Let me tell you this um, story as I finish. Um, I don't know if you remember, you've heard of uh, Charles Spurgeon. Charles Spurgeon was considered to be the prince of preachers in the uh, early, um, mid-1800s. Charles Spurgeon probably was the founder of the first mega church there was in London. And Charles Spurgeon had this illustration. And he said, that there, once upon a time there was this gardener who, um, who grew a beautiful carrot in his garden. And he had this big old carrot and he said, hey, I wanna take it to my king. He's so good to me, he's so nice to me. He's such a kind king, he's such a loving king. I, I'm gonna take this carrot. And he says, hey king, you're such a, I, I, I really like you king, so here's my big carrot that I grew. And he gave it to him. And so the king said, hey, thank you. And he said, okay, I'll give you a piece of, uh, piece of extra piece of land so you can continue growing more and more carrots. All right, wow, he was so happy he went home excited and happy. A wealthy man who raised horses, uh, he saw that and he said, whoa, if the gardener got a, if my gardener got a extra piece of land for a carrot, what would I get if I give him a horse? Don't you think? Wow. So he went on and they went to say to the king, king, oh king, this is, I bring you my horse. And so the, um, the king said, looked at the horse, got the horse, and I said, thank you. And he walked away. And as he was walking away, he, he looked back and he said, I'm not giving you anything. And let me explain why. The gardener gave me his carrot. You gave the horse to yourself. Do you understand that? He was bribing, he was bribing the king in order to get something back. What are the reasons you obey God? If you are obeying God to get to heaven, you're obeying him for the wrong reasons. You have not been free. You have not been set free. Obey God because you've been set free. Obey God because you are free, because you lack, you've been free, you lack no ability, you lack no opportunity, you lack, and you are not like the Ishmael types. You don't, you don't follow God out of duty, but out of a free desire of your heart. May God make us free Christians of all. Amen. Amen.